makes people truly fulfilled? Is it love? Family? Success? Or is it finding out who you really are? What you are truly made of? So you know your purpose here on Earth? And your connection to the universe? exist as physical beings in a physical reality, while our mind is in constant communication with unseen forces and unknown worlds. We are the visible part of a potentially infinite, invisible realm. How do the two worlds, mind and matter, coexist, collide, and interact? Because the energy is all around us and energy is all connected to all different types of energy you can communicate with all types of different things in your head you just need to think uh, please may I turn my energy on or anything like that a trigger of energy and then just turn it on and to Joseph it's quite a warm sensation inside your body it's quite tingly and then your subconscious mind kind of realises it. As a kid, I met him down this like alleyway, and ever since we've been playing in my head or somewhere else. But he speaks energy. It doesn't speak our language. Like many children, when I was young, I was very, very sensitive. Even at the age of five, I realized I could perceive the subtle energy. I would look at someone and I would see the energy around them. I could feel the emotions, what they were going through. I would put my hand up and uh, I could hear their thoughts sometimes. That got me on a journey of discovery and research in the field of consciousness, how consciousness works in the physical world and how we can answer some of these questions. For example, when we sense the presence of someone, but there's no one there, what are we tapping into? What are we coming in contact with? How can we perceive an event before it happens or remotely at a distance? Is it possible to change the chemistry of your body or even your DNA? How is it that you can move a physical object without any contact with this physical object? Or use your consciousness to see without your physical eyes? The rain was tapping and the windows and the wind was banging. These are the phenomena that we're exploring here with a new scientific approach that could potentially explain it all. And it turns out that this field that we call parapsychology is not only widespread, but it is universal. I have about 100 articles published in journals, and each one of those usually reports between one to five or six experiments. So somewhere in the number of hundreds of experiments, in terms of people involved, a few thousand people, perhaps. So I've studied probably numbering in the hundreds of cases. I've captured, I don't know how many dozens or hundreds of what we call EVPs, of recordings of voices. There are actually many credible institutions around the world that have dedicated many years of research in this field of psi phenomena, or what we call parapsychology. There are programs in the government that ran for over 20 years with millions of dollars in funding using psychic abilities, for example, to spy on a foreign government. We know for a fact that the Russians were involved in this. We know for a fact that the Chinese were and are probably still involved. The United States government and several other countries are more open-minded to this. 
Russia comes to mind. The Japanese were very involved. In fact, Sony Corporation had a long ongoing parapsychology program. We know our own CIA had been experimenting in psychic tests and abilities and projects like MK Ultra. The Israelis had an interest in it and may still. It's very well established. If these credible institutions and governments around the world are dedicating so much research and funding into this field, you would think there's something there. In graduate school in about 1970, I saw a banner on the wall that said, learn how to meditate. And I found out that I could debug the software I was writing in my nuclear physics studies in a meditation state much more accurately and quicker than I could if I were actually looking at the printouts. The lines that had errors in them were red. The others were black. And that kind of crashed my reality. Up until that time, like most physicists, I believe that if you couldn't measure it, then it didn't exist. So I would do experiments in that I could have one of these effects and then change a variable and then do it again and then change that variable a little more and do it again. From consciousness, your intent can modify, future probability can modify what happens in the physical world, which means that consciousness is the fundamental thing and the physical world is a derivative of consciousness. So I knew that consciousness theory should also contain physics theory. I finished my neurosurgical training at Duke in 1987. Uh, and then I started work at Harvard Medical School after doing a, a fellowship in cerebrovascular neurosurgery, uh, all along thinking I understood something about brain, mind, and consciousness. But that, of course, was the tremendous gift of, of my near-death experience, is finding out that what I thought was a worldview that we just assumed to be true is actually false, that consciousness is primordial. Uh, all of this emergent reality uh, basically emerges from consciousness. Uh, and it opens the door to a tremendous amount of understanding about consciousness and the mind and the power that human beings have over their unfolding reality. If consciousness is fundamental, where does the physical world end and consciousness begin? The physical world is a product of the consciousness world. One is within the other. It's not an either or. It's all one thing. It isn't as though there's a physical world and there's a mental world. There's only one world. It's all consciousness. It's not just localized in there, it's everywhere. And it's also not in space and it's not in time. It's somehow before space and time. That's what we mean by fundamental. Consciousness is a kind of a substance, a proto-substance perhaps, which is usually in a primordial, refined state that doesn't even appear to be matter or energy yet. But from that can emerge what we start seeing as a physical world. Just like ice can take on different phases, maybe we're talking about something like consciousness, which has different phases. So if consciousness is a continuum, then some forms of consciousness can appear to be hard matter. Physicists of the 20th century in 1920 and 1930 pondered this quite a lot and concluded that consciousness must be there, even there was no direct way of detecting it. We could only see its physical effects. Consciousness as a whole can be described by the quantum attribute. It's just that the quantum attribute does not follow Newton's laws. It's not physical. It's an entirely different part of the description of matter in the universe. If the physical world exists within consciousness, how come we can see one and not the other? We see physical reality, and we think that we are physical bodies walking around in this physical reality. What we are is consciousness. We are pieces of consciousness playing avatars in a virtual reality game called this physical world. So a conscious comes here with no memory. So when it logs onto its avatar, that avatar is all it knows. So all of its experience 
is experience with that avatar, with that fetus, with that newborn. This is an apple, this is mama, you know, this is the door, this is my house. It just learns how to interpret the data. What's really happening is that the computer is sending this individual unit of consciousness a data stream. That's how reality is created. I do believe we live in a virtual game, but I don't necessarily believe that we live in a simulation. Um, yes, I do. No. I don't know. I mean, I don't think simulation in the sense that every, it's like one, one giant video game. I don't necessarily believe we live in a computer that somebody else created, but I feel like if that's, that was the case, then there would be like technological glitches in the sky. When I think about simulations or the matrix, um, I believe we do. We probably thought up this whole construct before we came here and decided we're gonna go in and we're gonna play this game and here are the rules and we're gonna go deep into it and we're gonna completely forget that we made this game. I think we are the ones that are running the show. I don't know who's running the show, but I can tell you at times I think it's a shit show. Complete shit show. The waves that describe matter are basically spherical and surround the matter. But consciousness waves, which exist in the same quantum space, are now spiraling. Let's focus on the spin attribute because it is an attribute that is shared most intensely with the overall structuring of matter in the universe. My body has a whole lot of protons and electrons in it, and those produce a joint wave of great complexity that's describing my anatomy. Can you imagine that the description of spin in the universe starts with a global spin of the universe, which then restructures in more local spins, which have a memory of the initial global, we see all the galaxies rotating, and the stars in the galaxies are all rotating. The planets around the stars, like our Earth, is rotating once every 24 hours, and so on. Some of that rotation is a memory of the initial rotation. Therefore, the universe is imbued with this enormous description of rotation, from atomic matter scales to the global scales of galaxies and their clusterings and voids and the overall structuring of matter in our universe. Consciousness waves do share this um, attribute of spinning and rotating, and our minds can begin to interact with this. If the universe is based on spin and consciousness waves and can connect two minds, how would we demonstrate that in real life? I was at Fort Meade working as a Mideast analyst. What I didn't know is I lived next door to the operations officer and training officer for the remote viewing unit. They invited me over to their offices and sat me down and said, well, what we do here is collect intelligence against foreign threats using a parapsychology discipline called remote viewing. We essentially want to in, in, uh, invite you to become a psychic spy. The U.S. intelligence community had been following what the Russians were up to and the Soviets and discovered they were pursuing parapsychology pursuits. And so the CIA was obligated to check this out. And at a certain point, they were having such good success that the CIA said, we ought to be using it against the Russians, you know? And at that point, then it went operational and they started collecting intelligence against the Russians using remote viewing and the Chinese and a bunch of other people. A, a viewer who is well-trained and has a lot of experience, produces information that is clearly remote viewing in origin, you know, these clearly psychic, if you will, in origin, roughly 70% of the time. Because of the Soviet aggression, I have asked the United States Senate to defer further consideration of the SALT II Treaty. In the 70s, when Jimmy Carter was president, they were trying to figure out how to base these missiles so that um, the Soviets couldn't take out our missile systems. So they built this racetrack plant, kind of a shell game deal, where you had a bunch of these shelters out in the desert, and you'd shuttle the missile randomly between the shelters, 
and that would make it practically impossible for the Soviets to actually hit that missile. The problem was we had to find out if there was a way that the Soviets could beat the system. And so the uh, SRI, Stanford Research Institute folks, did a, a study and they were able to identify 100% of the time where the missile would be. And that information was provided to Carter and Carter canceled the basing plan because it became obvious that there was a way of beating it. I've directed that no high technology or other strategic items will be licensed for sale to the Soviet Union until further notice. It did affect policy. It did affect a high level government decision. And there is actually a letter from John Warner that confirms this. If there is such a thing as a psychic spy, I was curious to learn how the soldiers may have been trained to spy on the Russians. Actress, producer, and inspirational speaker, Rachel Brooks Smith, who is well familiar with mind-body work, was fascinated by the subject and decided to give it a try. So, Paul. Hello. Good to see you again. Thank you. We saw each other at that <laughs> conference. When I met you, I thought Rachel would be fascinated by the remote viewing. I am very fascinated, very excited to learn. I believe so much in, I guess, all of our superhuman abilities that we have that are untapped. And I am on such a path to discover those and strengthen those and, and share them. So I'm just, yeah, I couldn't be more excited. I, I, interesting the term you use, superhuman. Mm. I like to think that it's normal human. I love that, yeah. But that, but that our society hasn't recognized the fact that yes. this is part of normality. So remote viewing is an interesting thing. It's a way of focusing your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind knows the answer. It's your conscious awareness that doesn't. And so this serves to focus your subconscious mind, and then as you're going to write this stuff down, that's a way of bringing that into your conscious awareness. You're trying to get your subconscious talking to your conscious awareness. Mm. I've tried to narrow it down to very core elements to give you at least a flavor of how remote viewing works. I would love to try okay. it. It's, a, it's like a crash course. Yeah, right. It's a crash course. Every molecule, every atom that's here, we have over here. After a few hours of intense training with Paul, Rachel felt ready for the next step. What we're gonna do is call an outbounder experiment. So Caroline and a couple of other folks will pick a target outside of here where we won't be able to know what it is. Then they will go to that target and they will interact with it as best they can. Maybe they can touch it or feel it or smell it or ride around it, whatever it is. Meanwhile, we'll be back here. You're going to go find them consciously. You're gonna send your consciousness there to find where they are and then you'll report on the location where they're at. And if you pick up on it, you'll report on the things that they're doing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so just to just, clarify, you don't know where we're going. No, I have no idea. So are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. So Rachel, what you're going to do is you're going to direct your consciousness to the location where Caroline, Evan, and Dylan have gone, mm -hmm. and you're going to attempt to perceive and describe the setting that they're in, the interesting things there are to see, uh, generally the things there are to experience. Kind of pay attention to what they're, not. don't focus in on what they're doing, but if something happens that attracts your attention, make note of that. Okay. And you're going to be verbalizing this as you go. You're going to be writing down the impressions you get, and you're going to be sketching. Okay. So to get that started, I want you to write down Caroline location. Okay. okay. Just start kind of perceiving and describing in descriptive kind of terms mm -hmm. uh, okay. what you're experiencing. Uh, I see laughter. Okay, so you hear laughing sounds. I hear laughing, laughing sounds. Yeah, just put down laughing, that's fine. Okay. Um, I also feel like I see black lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see something red. Okay. Like a, yeah, like a feeling of red. I can't feel what, but I feel like... Uh, 
Caroline was like holding something. Okay. Go ahead and just put that down. It feels like it's black, like a black okay. kind of feeling. Does it have a, how does it feel? Um, like dense. Mm -hmm. uh, does it have a, 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 a texture to it or? It's rough, would be like smooth, but rough. I know it sounds weird, but. Okay. Just place your point of view above. Okay. And see if you get anything interesting from that perspective. Hmm. Try and take, you know, kind of a bird's eye view. I'm seeing mountains and, and the red. Like you're having some experience of like a red, and I don't want to see fall, but like a circular red thing. And then also that, and I can't tell really if it's Caroline or, but that there's like a, a black, you know, like someone's holding something that is black and like solid. <laughs> and something hot, like whether it's like a hot drink or something that's, that's hot, that's liquid. I'm gonna write Starbucks on the side. I don't know why I keep thinking of Starbucks, <laughs> but it's coming up for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, wrote it down. I'm seeing my mind keeps going to Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you wrote it down, you can yeah. let it go. Okay, yeah. let it go, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't feel like there's like, there's noise. Like it's um, just like noise going on. Um, Mm. For some reason, I'm seeing like um, like chain light, like Christmas lights. Okay. Yeah, decorative lights. Okay. Yeah. If the universe can connect two minds, I thought it would be interesting to try something different with this remote viewing experiment. I attempted to block Rachel's consciousness from viewing our location. I'm just kind of going back to what I know, okay. you know? That sounds like a good place to end. Go ahead and write end down. Okay. So go ahead and gather up your pages. Okay. And we will head out. Oh my gosh, this is blowing my mind. Like yeah, this is insane. Seriously. Lights, I wrote down lights. <laughs> And I literally saw there's Christmas lights and I said decorative lights in the front and a whole building is that is a structure that's unleveled. Like I am mind blown right now. Let's get it out. Oh my god! <laughs> really? Like I I I can't believe it. Like what I literally can't believe it. So what what happened? Well, first of all, one of the biggest things that I picked up on was decorative lights. Like I literally wrote like Christmas lights, decorative lights, and that's a Christmas tree. That's a Christmas tree. And right here you can see I wrote lights, Christmas decorative. The first thing I did yeah. is I walked all the way to the Christmas tree. I kept saying this like kind of reddish color and obviously like all the buildings. A red. A red. Amazing. <laughs> uh, but I also said, remember the circular thing next to the carousel? I said there's this red feeling that's like almost like a circular feeling that is that. So so then I, I actually came this way. Okay. I was like kind of, you know, holding on to this thing and the, you know, looking up to the Christmas yeah, I tree. Said, I said gray, I said gray and black bars. And then we saw this. We we're just so curious, like what well, you were picking I up. I had said as well, like I got like noise and like kids laughter and mm -hmm. playing. I'm literally, I'm so <laughs> mind blown. How did I get this right? So then what else did you do while you were here? So I came this way and I touched these bars like this. See, and I kept and I did the bars. this. And again, just the fact that I said Caroline holding black, black, dense, rough structures. And then later, like I even drew bars down here. Like I drew black bars and I kept feeling and sensing that. At one point I came up with like Starbucks and I was like, nope, I'm gonna left, ride that on the left side. Like I wanna get rid of that, you know? And over here on the next page, you can see I wrote Starbucks. <laughs> like, was there a Starbucks involved? I don't yes. know about, no way. <laughs> Did you guys go to Starbucks? Yes. So, I, mean, uh, yes. I should have warned you, don't take any side trips. She said, uh, there's a hot liquid involved. And then that led to the Starbucks thing. And I'm thinking, oh, crud, did they stop at Starbucks? <laughs> oh, I should have told them not to do that. Towards the end of the process, so they say the last five minutes or so, Yeah. did you feel like you're having any difference in your experience and your perceptions? As if, were they stronger? Were they weaker? All I know is that there was a specific point when I felt like 
that's it. Like I don't, there's no more. Whereas for a long time, it just kept coming up and coming up and coming up. And then there was definitely a certain point where I didn't have any more. You know what I mean? There was just no more. That validates sure. that she was at the target. Does <coughs> it, that make sense? It shows that there's a boundary condition that you can interrupt the process with, which shows there is a process to be interrupted. Exactly. Right? This was a crash course yes. in just a few <laughs> hours, and you've yeah. never been here before. What did you learn about yourself? I think it just reconfirmed for me the belief that we have so much more capabilities than we think we do, you know, and that I think if you can have an open mind and learn and try new things, uh, I mean, who knows what you'll be capable of, especially after this experience. If we could all live just in more curiosity, not mm -hmm. trying so hard, but just being curious about life and about our abilities, I feel like we could achieve so much more as well as just experience and enjoy <laughs> life mm -hmm. so much more. When the CIA declassified the program, they conveniently left out all of the assessments from the people who used our material. So it's almost like they didn't want people to know how successful it was. Two minds can be telepathically connected. There is a path of coherence with this spinning attribute of consciousness that's joining the two minds these quantum waves describing the structure of my hand and this couch and your body and the tree on the other side of the room, all of these waves are standing describing the physical structure of a body which will remain fixed in the universe according to Newton's laws for physical matter. Two physical particles can share properties at a distance through entanglement. Now, everyone is plugged into the same field. So if consciousness waves are spiraling, they carry the same pattern as the larger unified field. They become coherent. And through entanglement, the consciousness of one person could become entangled with that of another at a distance. It seems that our consciousness may be entangled with the physical world and in many ways. If that is the case, then there must be physiological effects we could detect as a result of this interaction. When we reach 30 Dr. Dean Radin is chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. He agreed to run an experiment with my friend Rod that would demonstrate the physiological effect of intuitive abilities. So what we're going to show you is a series of pictures, some of which will be emotional and some of which will be quite calm. Uh, all you need to do is look at the pictures because we have in front of you an eye tracking system that will measure the pupil size of your eyes. And the reason we use pupil size is because it reflects your emotional processing. What we're interested in this is not how you respond when you're looking at the picture, but whether you respond before the picture actually shows up. It, it could explain many, th many phenomena that we think of as psychic because we're getting information about something which has not actually even occurred yet. In this case, we're using pictures because they're fun to look at, uh, and we can take advantage of the emotional response in the eye, but it seems to work on any sensory level. So the hypothesis um, here is that my higher consciousness, which isn't bound by third world dimensional reality, senses of what's coming, my eyes dilate. Whether it's other dimensional or higher self or other self, we, we don't know. I prefer to think of it only at this point in terms of unconsciously what is happening. And then unconscious is reflected in physiology. Okay, so let's, let's start it up. And it's going to go all by itself now. And we'll let you do it by yourself. Okay.
do the analysis. Yeah, what we're interested in is what is the pupil doing before the emotional or calm picture shows up. The probability of the pupil size beforehand is actually a little bit bigger than the, than the probability for the emotional or for, for the calm picture. And the pupil can't move that yeah, much. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, half a millimeter is actually quite a lot. And this was about maybe a half a second before the image actually showed up. If we are able to measure the physiological effects of consciousness on the body, then we could also potentially influence a biological system, water, or even our own DNA. For the past 25 years, Dr. Glenn Ryan has pursued a career in DNA research, neuroscience, and quantum biology at prestigious institutions such as Harvard and Stanford Medical Schools. I thought that we should talk about pH because a lot of people understand that pH, higher pH in water uh, is better for health. And so I thought this experiment may be very useful. The body needs to be at a very central pH, around 7.2. Uh, and if it's too high or too low, we get into trouble. Can you explain how this uh, instrument works? pH is a measure of the amount of hydrogen uh, in the water. And there's a special probe that's sensitive to hydrogen, and then they convert it to electrical signal, and you get a number. On five separate occasions, I measured the pH over a course of an hour. And it doesn't change more than the very last segment. That's a hundredth of a unit, a pH unit. If you can change a tenth of a unit, that would be a very profound change. So the idea is for me to affect the water and then uh, either up or down, and right. then we, we will get an instant reading. Of... We will see it in real time. I'll be right back. Okay, great. Let me see what I can do. <laughs> my intent was to lower the pH in the water. I visualized that my mind was connected to the hydrogen molecules in the water and getting them to multiply. More hydrogen molecules means a lower pH. So we've started at 757. 757. And I dropped it to 747. Seven, seven. That's a whole uh, unit. That's a large effect. The fact that you can change this particular parameter, the acid alkaline balance in water, implies that you could change it in the body. The body has this amazing intelligence. It knows what it needs. So the fact that you can create an environment with your consciousness and your thoughts and your intention that pH can change at all would allow the body to change the pH in the appropriate direction that it needs. The dogma is you, you can't change your body chemistry uh, by thinking about it, but the implication is that the intention and the imagery that, that you use can be used to change your own internal pH. And yes, just let your body do what it knows is the optimal direction and magnitude for change. Let's do another experiment, which is different from the pH meter. I have a special device here, it's called a potentiostat. This allows me to take a measure of the conductivity of the DNA itself. DNA is very sensitive to human consciousness from my own previous research. The experiment to see is if you can influence the conductivity. Okay, first sample of DNA, and now we're going to do three controls in a row. Okay, so I'm going to write control this, here. This is going to be... Control one. Control one. So what we're actually doing now is we're calculating the experimental error by looking at what happens to the, to the DNA when there's no intervention. In this case, we're doing the three controls at three different times. Then we're going to do it a fourth time in a row, and okay. except you're going to intervene. Okay. So we know what the variation will be, uh, and the experimental error, as I was saying before, will be if there's no intervention. Okay. Thirteen point two. Thirteen point two. That's the control. Control number two is 
12.9, so. 12.9, okay. Control number three. Yeah. 12.46, so the average is 12.9. 12.9 kilo ohms. So if you now are able to, with your consciousness, resonate with this and either get it to go up or down, then we'll be able to measure it. My intent was to increase the electrical conductivity. So I visualized that my mind was producing an electrical current in the DNA at a very high speed. Okay, I think I did it. it I felt like it responded very quickly. That's why I kind of stopped. Okay, so here is the magic number we're looking for. And it's way, way yeah. down to 6.5. Yeah. yeah, I felt like it responded very quickly and it was, wow. it's like I zapped it or something. So that's what I'm saying, yeah. 6.5. Let's, well, let's do it a couple of times. And this is the same sample. 6.5 kilo zero. ohms. Five zero, right. Oh, and that's gosh. what you, Okay, so here's number two, and this one's measuring at 6.37. The fact that there's such a huge difference so quickly, it's almost like there's no question that something happened. Am I correct uh, to say that? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, right. like, how could it jump from from 12 to, to 6? six. Okay. I mean, and, and, now, and this one this is, now, is again the now rating 6.2. Okay. That's a large, <laughs> a large, robust effect demonstrating that at least your consciousness is able to resonate with and change the electrical properties of DNA. And the implication for the audience is that if you can do it, then we can do it, and with our own intention, we can heal our own body. My theory is that you're just projecting energy. And whether you project it into a test tube or whether you project it into your own body or whether you project it into my body, it's the same phenomena. It's just a different target receiving the energy. I've actually done comparisons using DNA uh, with different machines. Certain machines were better than others, but always the human consciousness was better at resonating with and changing DNA. When you say better at resonating, is it faster, more efficient, more powerful? Which is it? All of the above. Faster, for sure. From my own research, I can certainly say that an electromagnetic field can affect water and takes at least 12 hours to do the same effect that you did in 12 seconds. So if nothing else, human consciousness is much more efficient. It's empowering as humans to know that we can heal ourselves, that we don't have to rely on a drug and we don't have to rely on a machine. And that's considered legitimate science, the ability of the mind to influence the body. They've discovered that the more the DNA is capable of conducting electricity, the faster and stronger is its ability to self-heal. So we've just demonstrated that my intent or my consciousness literally changed the conductivity, therefore affected the molecular functioning of this biological system, the water or the DNA. Yes, you're changing the molecular level, but you're also changing the quantum level, which underlies everything. And then you change the atomic level, then you change the molecular level, and then you change the structural level. So it doesn't matter whether our physical bodies are made of physical matter or electromagnetic energy or quantum energy, because with consciousness, which underlies all of those fundamental energies, you can change them all because it is at the heart and source of all these qualities which make up the human body. Our consciousness communicates with our physical body but our cells also have a way of communicating with us on many levels and in different ways. Dr. Jim Jimzewski, a fellow of the Royal Science Society and distinguished biochemistry professor at UCLA, shared with us his revolutionary work in the field of sonocytology, which detects the vibrations coming out of the human cells. Originally, I was in IBM in Zurich, Switzerland, in the research laboratory, and we were developing a new type of microscope. The first experiment we wanted to do, actually, was on stem cells. 
It was then 9-11 at the, that time. And so we couldn't get those samples from Italy. And so my graduate students suggested we look at something else. And we decided we'd look at yeast. Because yeast is, you know, very simple to work on. And that's when using this technique called atomic force microscopy, it's basically like a little finger that can feel things. We started to notice a fairly high frequency vibration. The first thing I thought it was some kind of noise in the system. So we kept doing different experiments and established it was a real effect of the live yeast cell. The technology we use employs a thing called a cantilever. It's like a, a, a small flat lever. And at the end of that lever, there's a tiny tip. And when we bring that tip in contact with a yeast cell, the tiniest motion, even on the level of subatomic motion, is picked up by the cantilever. We use a laser beam, we shine it off the end of the cantilever, and that amplifies this tiny motion so that we can record it. Let's just, for the sake of argument, say we take one cell. Inside a human cell, there will be a lot of mechanical processes going on, transporting nutrients, moving things around, there will be motion of the DNA. All of these things can occur essentially at different rates. So the end result is complicated motion on a very small scale. You mentioned that the healthy cell has a continuous harmonious sound, but then the diseased cell has an erratic sound. We can treat them with different chemicals that affects the molecular motors that caused um, this strange process where the cell was singing. And then it, it started to get, you know, a bit interrupted. And so it was a process until it stopped. So if you look at a dead cell, for instance, you will effectively hear something like a white noise, you know, like shh. The cells communicate through, through that effect. And in fact, the fact that I'm speaking at the moment, there's a bunch of cells in my throat, right? Resonate and communicate with you. Since the cell has its own cell vibration and resonance, uh, the organ has its own vibration, the entire body then has its own vibration. Is it possible that we are actually an entire instrument, an organism that is resonating, and therefore that's how we are perhaps affecting each other? I definitely believe that we are able to influence ourselves, influence our others, a fascinating observation comes from our own planet, the solar system, and the universe, which also emit sounds similar to the sounds of the cells inside our own human body. The thoughts that we have create sounds in other people, in ourselves, it affects our organs, and it affects other people's bodies and organs, and create different levels of vibrations that will trigger consciousness effects in another person and can affect their health and all kinds of things from that. The power of that unconditional love to fully uh, influence everything in our existence, if we're simply open to it, if we're resonant with it, in our uh, kind of loving heart consciousness, if we resonate with that loving force. And I do think that if you're a good person, you know, and you really just kind of give all that stuff out there, you look at everything in a positive manner, so everything that comes to you is a positive. I also think it keeps your body healthier to you have less stress when you open yourself up to to positive things rather than dwelling in what's going to go wrong. We know our intent, our thoughts, our emotions affect how we feel. But have you considered that what you say may also have a direct and measurable influence on your body? 
A relatively new field of medical science analyzes your vocal imprint to identify toxins and pathogens in the blood and help diagnose many illnesses. Don Estes has developed a new approach to this vocal technology that demonstrates not only the frequency imprint, but the patterns that are present in your voice. Karina Smirnoff's world is all about music and sound. She's a world-renowned professional dancer and choreographer. She was particularly intrigued by the impact sound vibrations can have on her body and her overall well-being. Well, I've always been busy working and creating my career, and I always wanted kids. There was never a point in my life that I didn't want kids, but it's also difficult because if I have a child, then I have to take time out of my work and out of my career. I'm gonna introduce you to my friend. Okay. And then we'll see what happens. I'm just gonna let you discover it. You'll see what I'm doing. Okay. Karina, why don't you tell us about your life? Well, my schedule is really, really busy. I travel the world internationally constantly. I do 14 to 16 hour days. I always feel like there is never enough time to do everything that I want. So what you're actually gonna be doing today is you're gonna be doing a new technology called the portico, which you express yourself into. So we take the voice in, we analyze that, and at the same time that that's happening, I'm plotting this pattern on this screen. Most people use this technology as an intention machine, an intention manifestation machine. I want to speak my intentions into it, and I want that to come true. So we'll have you put that on okay. and flip it around that way. Perfect. Can you talk about something that's really, really bothering you right now? At this point, the only thing I'm missing is having my own kids, having a family. I feel like I'm running out of time to have a child where my parents can also get to enjoy their grandchild, where I'm not a mom who gets, uh, you know, to pick up her child from kindergarten and they start thinking, that, is that your grandma? Okay, so Dawn can show you how these are real patterns that are inside your cells. Yeah, well, the first thing I noticed about this is all of her outward radiance has kind of gone away. We see more, again, of these, uh, these oval shapes that are vertical ovals, which means there's a lot of focus on the potential, more so than the imaginary. So on this horizontal plane, you got a lot of energy tied around time. So, Karina, when you look at this pattern, how do you feel? It's busy without structure. Chaos. Maybe. So, why don't you switch to something you really, really love? Something that's working in your life that you want more of? I do what I love. I get to travel the world. I love traveling. I get to experience different countries, cultures. Um, so I love that and I enjoy that tremendously. Um, and I'm also doing a lot of things with the kids. I have a big kids program that is taking off really, really fast. This is like having a dream come true. In terms of work and where it's going, I couldn't be more grateful and happier. Great. All right. So now we see a lot of harmony going on in there. We've got a lot of circles outside of the, the center there. That really brings your energy out into the environment. And, it, and it's gonna have a tremendous effect on people. Well, it's a, it's a responsibility to, to self as well as to other people to be able to stay in the right state of mind, to, to stay positive. What's your favorite color? I've always loved yellow because I find that like, um, it's happy, it's a ray of sunlight, it's warm, it's life bringing, it's yellow. Yellow's happy. All Great. Right. And uh, uh, tell us about the, your least favorite colors. Um, my least favorite is dark burgundy. Like that dull, not even dark, like dull burgundy. I find it stale and 
flat and old. This is interesting. When she was saying yellow, I saw more yellow. We saw yellow. more yellow here. And then when she was saying burgundy, there was more burgundy. burgundy. So if I want to feel happy, I should wear more yellow? She doesn't even have to wear yellow. She could say or think yellow. That's true. That's what we were talking about earlier, is what you say is what reality is. And that's the hardest ah. thing for people to really get. Well, thank you very much. This was incredible. It was very eye-opening, and mm. I learned a lot. I believe the experience today not only enhanced, but it kind of proved that we create our reality. So if there's something that we want, we need to project it out there, we need to manifest it, we need to at least give ourselves the platform to create it. There is something more to a human being other than just a physical being. It's kind of like a fingerprint. It's like uh, each one of us has a individual everything. We have an individual fingerprint. We have a voice print. We have brain frequencies and heart beats. Your heart shows how you're feeling about things. Your brain shows how you're thinking about things. But your voice does that immediately. When you say it into the real world, you make it real. And if you say it enough, it will become real. Reality actually starts on the other side. A lot of scientists that are beginning to see this see it as a mirror universe. Any real thing that's on this side in the direct space we live in that is not 100% its true self, it hasn't totally actualized yet, it still has a potential self, a missing part that's still on the other side. Those two components are discrete, but intention has the ability to reach across that veil and consider these actual and potential components and bring them together. And as soon as it brings them together, a little string shows up over here on this side. You have these automata as the most primary basic level of reality that when added together by intention, they become strings, which become primary particles, which become atoms, which become molecules. The molecules come together and make up cells. The cells come together and make up tissues. The tissues make up organs. The organs make up superorganisms like human stars, star systems and galaxies and that sort of thing. We know our intent can change the outcome of our physical reality, thanks to the placebo effect in medical treatments, and to the famous double-slit experiment first performed by Thomas Young in 1801. This experiment demonstrates that a particle, which should travel in a straight line according to the laws of physics, creates instead a diffraction pattern only when it is detected and measured by an observer. Now that's called the, the observer paradox. Why is it that when, you, when an observer doesn't look, you get particle distribution, two lumps of particles behind each slit, and when the observer looks, you get a diffraction pattern. The particle doesn't exist, you see, until some player gets that information of the particle being there in their data stream. Once that's done, it has to stay there. It has to, you know, it has to be a particle from then on. So it acts like a particle. That's what brings it into this reality. It becomes a part of the physical world. Then anybody else that looks there will see that same thing. It is actually very empowering to think that we live in a physical world that hasn't happened yet. It is your observation. In other words, it is you. It is your consciousness that is reaching into the world of probability and bringing it into existence. Our voice contains the patterns of our thoughts and emotions, while our brain is registering and storing these patterns in the form of EEG waves. We can, in fact, replay these EEG waves and translate them back into an actual sound. Another contribution to this concept comes from audio engineer Colin Harrington, 
who claims to be able to see his thoughts, his emotions, and his dreams on a projected screen. I've always been a very vivid, lucid dreamer, as long as I can remember, uh, three, four years old. And I would describe my dreams to people, and I was met with a lot of skepticism. So I felt compelled to try to figure out a way to show people or let them see and hear my dreams. When I got into uh, computer sound and composition, a lot of my master's uh, was focused on various different EEG projects and interactive multimedia and things like synesthesia and changing color into sound and sound into colors. Color is a frequency, light is a frequency, brain waves are a frequency, all of the sound that you hear is a frequency. Those correlations and blending those with diverting them into other sensory inputs are making the internal external and the intangible tangible. There's a whole field called cymatics that uh, turns vibrations into the patterns. And you can see the wave interference patterns that are very elaborate and uh, striking and beautiful. Using sometimes different types of technologies like this can help you retrain your brain. You see the results of how your mind works. Naomi Grossman is one of the most creative actors I know. She applies various mind-body techniques in her acting career as well as in her real life. She was fascinated by the idea that she could have a visual and auditory representation of how her mind operates. It's a one-to-one -one, uh, real-time response. So as your mind is, is evolving and changing based on your, your mood and your alertness, it will generate music in real time. And I can run that into pretty much any instrument that I want. So we'll be able to hear your a representation of your feelings. Oh God, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit of saline solution on this. Okay. Uh, it's nothing strange. It's used mm. as a conductor. Oh, I like this look. <laughs> it's definitely a little futuristic. Yeah. So okay. this will uh, be a little bit better of an example if you wanted okay. to stress yourself. Out. Go for the stress. about something stressful one more time. So I think we can see an incredible range wow. Being in the world of acting, being able mm. to turn it on like that is really impressive because I've run this uh, various iterations of this software on hundreds of people, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, I've never seen someone be able to turn it on and turn it off. Mm. Uh, you know, by going to there, wherever there is. Uh, so I mean, it's like when you're playing make, make believe, you yeah. know, and. So you're, you're a perfect playing test subject. house, and I'm the mom, and you're the dad. And <laughs> go there. I thought this was spot on. I mean, it was insanely accurate. Could you show us a little bit of the the visualizer? In other words, as opposed to hearing. Is it possible to see the thoughts and emotions? Sure. What I have this map to is blue would be a more calm, and a, a red would be a more angry. And then we're going to have purple right here in the middle. So we can see if you can change the colors. I'm going to try. OK. <laughs> Stress. Go ahead and try to calm down and reach a state of peace. I 
I really love the one-to-one -one real time relationship here. It's amazing. So did I it go was red, red and then did I go blue? Oh yeah. Absolutely. I I've spent plenty of time going red yeah. in my mind. Whereas going blue, you know, I have less experience with that. And it was fun. It, I enjoyed like going to Jamaica and like <laughs> feeling the sun on my skin. It can be a conscious decision with training. Uh, you yeah. obviously have a, a certain um, aptitude for turning yourself calm or mm -hmm. turning yourself angry that most other people may not have right off the bat. But uh, it's something that you can learn even if you don't have that kind of focus you can train yourself. Now what we'd like to do is train the computer to recognize an image. Let's try with a positive image. Let's try something with, with a positive. This is the image that we're gonna be using. We can teach the computer how you react to a certain image. I included this blank white slide in there to be nothingness unless I you're recalling see. a specific pattern. So let's try to recall that image, put yourself on stage. and then think of nothing. Nothing. Put yourself back on that stage and feel the way that you felt when you were there. Wow. It's, it's crazy. It reminds me of that expression, when it rains, it pours. It's no wonder that, like, when things are going well, they go really, really well, or vice versa. Like, I, those times when you, you know, I booked two national commercials and got a boyfriend all in one week, it's like, well, yeah, I'm putting something out there. I'm, fo I'm fixating on the positive. Mm -hmm. And it just goes to show, like, we need to flood our brains with positive images. It was so interesting, you know, I mean, we have so much power. We have the power to affect change in our lives, so why not choose the positive, since we have a choice? Yeah. Did this help you kind of see how your mind can go either way in a split second? Yes. And how your brain is registering? It's like, when in doubt, if you get the choice, which because we have the choice, go to Jamaica. Our thoughts and emotions can be perceived as sound and images. Sound can be turned into an image, as in the biological sonar that is used by several kinds of animals, whereby the animal emits a sound that resonates and echoes back a visual description of the environment that they're in. In plant life, studies have shown that trees emit a frequency, and this is how trees can communicate with other trees about incoming predators or weather patterns. How could there be oneness with animal life, plant life, and the earth itself without a mechanism that allows you to maintain this oneness? If plants and animals can communicate through seemingly invisible frequencies, is it possible that humans could also be doing the same? We are surrounded by this invisible pool of energies and waves. We know electromagnetic waves, sound waves exist, but we don't see them. So the idea is how much of these waves can we actually detect on this side of the veil? Ex-FBI agent Ben Hansen has been investigating and documenting paranormal anomalies around the world using multiple technologies. He volunteered to demonstrate these technologies to us, so I decided to bring a friend along. Corey Feldman needs no introduction. Child actor, filmmaker, and musician, Corey's fascinated by supernatural phenomena and wanted to join us for some interesting experiments. When I was working for the Bureau, um, they, they have looked into phenomena such as UFOs of and cat mutilations. Yeah. The devices that, that I use conducting kind of our own experiments into something that's called ITC research. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've heard of that before. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, instrumental transcommunication. So in about the 70s, people started experimenting and finding out you could take all sorts of electronic devices and voices were showing up on, on the tapes. Eh, a little skeptical. But. Uh, you know, and so was I. 
yeah. completely skeptical yeah. because the prime theory of what we call uh, capturing an EVP, okay, electronic voice phenomena, is that we're dealing with electromagnetic waves. And what they found was that you can take um, a device such as this, which is an induction coil, okay? This experiment we're gonna do, you'll speak into the red tape recorder, then what we're going to do is transmit through this induction coil to the blue tape recorder. The blue is the receiver, the red is the transmitter. Is we're gonna take your voice and I'll have you make a message on the red tape recorder. Okay. So the first thing I want you to do, if you could take the battery out of the blue recorder for me. Sure. And there's a blue battery in it too. <laughs> Isn't that convenient? Okay, Great. put that there. Here so for quality control, we'll take the blue recorder and we'll just set it over here out of the way. Okay. Okay. Now the red recorder, I would like you to leave a message. Captain's log, start date 2018. This is Captain Corey of the USS Red Recorder leaving a message that may be detected in other universes or dimensions. <laughs> Great. I awesome. Love that. So I can see it's there. Uh, you left a 20 second message. Perfect. Okay, so it's here. But just to make sure, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, what we call an EMF meter electromagnetic field meter. And as we play this back, you can see the needle fluctuating. Hmm. The EMF meter is picking up electromagnetic field from this device. Got it. His voice is on the recorder, but what is being picked up here is not the sound. Okay, it's being picked up by an induction uh, coil, which creates a magnetic field. It's just basically magnetic energy. That's magnetic traveling. energy, exactly. So we'll put the meter aside, and now we have a transmitting coil, which is broadcasting the message. And if you could now put the battery back into the recorder. Huh. Okay, so we've shown it was not recording at the same time this was, so there's no way it picked up on it. So I'm not gonna touch these on. two coils together. Okay, you see they're close because they've gotta be close to each other's fields. Okay, but they're not touching. Yeah. Powered on. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So, now we have our blue recorder. Okay, which uh, we'll call it the receiving recorder. Just get a simple little speaker here so that we can hear it better. We're gonna plug into it. Fingers crossed. Let's see if your message is now on the captured recorder. Captain's log, start date 2018. This is Captain Corey of the USS Red Recorder leaving a message that may be detected in other universes or dimensions. <laughs> well, there you go. That's <laughs> Do you see how clear it was? Very clear. Very clear. That was not done by radio waves. It was not done acoustically. We've transferred it seemingly through some magical energy, but science knows is an electromagnetic field. So the theory behind this is it's energy-based. It has to be, okay? All we have here is a piece of metal with wire wound around inside of it. What do you think the biggest induction coil uh, let's think grand scale. What do we have would be the biggest induction coil that surrounds us all? The Earth. The Earth. If it's that or if it's some other energy we don't quite understand, we're all connected to it. You just demonstrated how sound waves can be transferred from one point to another without physical contact. I can think of somebody across the world and just by thinking about it, They'll them, call you. They call you. Yeah, I do it all the time. The reality is we're all plugged in to the same source. I completely agree. We can take this whole concept of imprinting your residual onto a physical object, okay, visually, and in a special camera that, that I have. So if I could have you both just have a seat right there. Okay. And just relax, okay? I'm gonna come over here. Okay. And uh, I have a specialty camera here. The average human puts out about the same amount of heat energy as a 100 watt light bulb. Hmm. Okay, so that's what you're doing right now, both of you just sitting there. Energy is, as we know, in the law of thermodynamics, it, it could be transferred from one thing to another, right? And heat being an energy, a wave in a sense, you guys are emanating that now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're interacting with everything you come in contact with. 
So just by sitting there in those chairs, you're transferring energy. Sometimes you'll have a masseuse to like do that, and then they'll just kind of put their hands above you, but yeah. they're not touching yeah. you, but you can feel the heat radiating yeah. through your body, right? That's the same yeah, thing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, you might even feel that when you meet certain people, kind of the energy to transfer. Okay. So if I could have you both stand up and just go okay. hang out there on that couch for a second. Okay. All right, I'm gonna let this record just so we have enough here. So before you guys sat down, I took a video of those chairs you're sitting in mm -hmm. with a thermal camera, which sees into the infrared spectrum. So it senses heat, not much of the visible light at all. Okay, and you'll see here the chairs are, are primarily blue. Above you, we have some red heat, which is actually a heater. Okay, a vent up there that's that's heating up the books oh, on the top I see shelf. It. Yep. Okay. Okay. So when you sat down, there you are in full color. Uh, the darker areas represent the colder spots, so you can see your pants and the cuffs that are not actually touching your pants are darker, mm -hmm. and um, your are darker. faces are the, the brightest because they're the, the hottest in frame. So what I wanted to show you was the point that you guys get up here. So you get up out of your chairs. And bam, look at that. <laughs> that is an imprint. Woo. Yes. and That's some serious heat. <laughs> look at that. Oh, wow, look at mine, really bright where my face was. You can see where your hand was on the left hand, and you, I think, had an elbow or something mm -hmm. like you were just sitting there. Right. Yeah, but it's really from... And it seems like Torso. that's right, yeah, it's right where my heart would be. Yeah, the chest seems mm -hmm. to be the brightest. It's not just the heat that we feel, but it's also an energy we can see. We affect everything in the material world with our energy. So if we have good energy and we're putting good energy out to the world, then we're going to get good responses back. But if we're putting out mm -hmm. negative energy all the time, then you're going to have negative come in and affect your life that way until you make a conscious effort to stop. And once you go, I'm going to believe, Everything is good. Everything is fine. It's all going to work itself out. And then all of a sudden, things start to reverse themselves. I will never tell somebody with 100% certainty what I captured on this tape recorder or on this video is a ghost, an alien. I don't know that. I don't believe in ghosts, mind you. I never did. Um, but there have been things that have happened where it makes you question it. All we know is it's unexplained, and it's something that we can't see, but it's being perceived, and somehow technology is capturing it. Obviously, I believe that there is much beyond this reality. I mean, I have many variations on that, so if we're talking about the spiritual realm or if we're talking about the interdimensional realm or, you know, there's, there's a lot of different kind of understandings of what that means. We probably occupy the same physical space. So if we do, but we, we don't see each other or all the time, what would you call that? And, and dimension is, is just kind of like the only word that comes to mind. So multiple dimensions, yes, I think it's very possible. The fact that people said, oh, well, this is God, I believe is just a, a limited capability of understanding at that time what they saw in miracles and things that happened before them were unexplainable in any other way other than saying, that's God. Outside of the physical, I believe that there is an energy out there. I do believe there's a bigger force at play. Something's happening that's bigger than us. Beyond the body, once we leave our meat puppet behind, we go back to our actual true existence. At times I get frustrated that I can't see it, even though I have like these beady Canadian close set eyes that I would hope that are like laser beams to be able to see these things. I can't and I get really frustrates me. You know, it's like you pull the goggles off the virtual reality in your home again. And when you're brought back, you maybe choose what you want to be. Our reality in essence could be different to different people Although I do think there is one truth. The problem is that science has not caught up to be able to explain the, the rules by which it operates. PK 
is short for psychokinesis. It is the ability to move a physical object without physical contact. I've been working with PK for the past couple of years with very interesting results. It is your intent that is interacting with the physical object that is getting it to respond. But the minute you let go of the result is when you get the result. At the Institute of Biosensory Psychology in St. Petersburg, Russia, you can learn how to use your consciousness to move a physical object. A graduate from this institute is UC Berkeley's quantum physicist, Dr. George Weissman, who has been able to demonstrate these effects repeatedly and over the past several years. Well, is it just a freely suspended object? and it's inside a glass cylinder so that it's isolated from the heat, from drafts, and so on. If you leave it alone, it doesn't move at all. What we do is to basically focus on it and make it turn. So from the audio physics perspective, this is impossible. It's not there's consciousness and there's objects. Objects and space and time all are manifestations within consciousness. It's a kind of unification. Matter, so-called particles, are more like information carriers. Particles are not things. Even once you've seen it, it's not an actual existing particle, but then it can be thought of in a way. It is described by this wave function, which is just a probability function. I asked PK practitioner and meditation teacher Sean McNamara to facilitate a session with my friend Rachel, who had never practiced PK before and was eager to try. Sean, I'm so excited about this. I mentioned Rachel to you. I can't tell you how excited I am. I cannot wait to learn. Yeah. It sounds like you have a lot of confidence already. Like some part of you already believes that it's possible. Is that true? Oh, I do. I have been studying and so passionate about the power of thought and intention. I mean, ever since I was 14, you know, through a really difficult time in my life, I saw a movie that changed my life and I had this like very life-changing experience where I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to perform, I want to act, I want to inspire people just like that film did for me through focusing on that, intending it, writing it down, having vision boards, like seeing it, watching it every day, seeing myself do it every day. I ended up playing the lead in the sequel to that same film six years later, something that everybody told me was impossible. Where you place your awareness is where energy goes. Mm. That's basically all we're doing here with this psychokinesis experiment. We're gonna produce movement by using our mind in a certain way. And it's really like baking a cake. You put all the right ingredients together and you put them in the oven and you give it enough time. And when enough time has passed, you pull out this beautiful, delicious cake. And no calories involved. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. It is a meditation process in itself, and the way other types of meditation have those life lessons wrapped in, you see it right in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. If you're too tense, it stops moving. When you relax, it starts moving again. Mm -hmm. If you don't give it enough time, it doesn't work. If you let go, it works. So this is just another way of showing, showing those basic life principles that we all know about. And so at this point, we can lift up your container, and you'll want to do this very slowly, because when you do it too quickly, it knocks off the tin foil from the needle. And then you'll want to just put your hands on the glass on either side of the object. Eventually, it'll start responding to your breathing pattern and to the level of relaxation in your mind. So yeah, when it starts, it means that the shift has occurred within you. And mine just started responding too, so I think we're sharing a field now. <laughs> is it working? That is so cool to watch. Yeah, I mean, it was totally still. It's moving. As maybe silly to some as this may sound, sending love to the material, saying like, you know, I love you, like, let's work together on this, let's be one, you know, let's move together. Look what it's doing as you're talking about love. Your heart's opening as you're yeah. talking about it, and it feels it. And I can also feel whenever I start to feel those ego thoughts or wanting to get it right or afraid of failure, then there's this disconnect. Um, and I think that's so powerful to understand that that's the whole thing of ego. It's like the want to get it right is can block you. But when you just allow 
and, and be filled with love and energy. Like, amazing, miraculous things can happen. Rachel will now attempt to place two objects inside the glass container and see if she could perhaps influence one object and not the other. I was wondering if I am here, if I'll have more ability. Sure, keep going, because the other one Look, just started working. going. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Clearly, Rachel's talented. I mean, that's, <laughs> like, amazing. And it's her first time. And this is the hardest condition to be under. Not only mm. is it your first time, but you have six cameras on you. <laughs> there are other people in the room watching, yeah. hoping, mm. expecting. Yeah. These are the hardest conditions for anyone to operate under for a psychokinesis, so congratulations. Did you have fun? Oh my gosh, it's so much fun after even just those two experiments. You know, I learned so much about myself. If you practice these things, like you literally feel like a superhuman version of yourself. Superhuman, that's the title <laughs> of the film, yeah. The photons that are bouncing off of the object are going in through my eyes, the rods and cones are producing an electrical signal that goes to the back of my brain, which reconstructs an image. So what I'm really looking at when I look at the piece of paper, or tin foil, or a toothpick, whatever it is I'm moving, I'm looking at my own mind. If we were truly separate from each other, there's no way we'd be able to do PK because of the inherent separateness. But if we can dissolve that sense that we're separate from everything and increase the sense that we're already one, then that makes PK possible. Of course it's possible because when I'm moving an object, I'm moving my own mind. Dr. Mike Willicke is a professor of neurobiology from the University of California in Berkeley and a researcher at an NIH-funded laboratory. His interest in PK began after a profoundly transformative Zen meditation experience, which led him to alter entirely his model of reality. This is completely sealed. Any electric I started working with Mike in 2017, and I was most impressed by the scientific rigor he brings to the field, and also how far we were able to stretch the boundaries and possibilities of this methodology. The model that I think is probably more truthful is a model that actually a, a famous physicist, John Wheeler, developed, which he calls the participative uh, universe. Instead of having a camera or the eye and then a display in this linear sort of causal relationship, the universe is actually this self-excitatory loop where there's no separation between the observer and the observed, but because they form this continuous interactive feedback. And so this is why I started to believe in the possibility of PK as a scientist, because the object is truly not outside of you. But it's so, if, for example, if I want to move my finger, my finger is connected to my consciousness through neural pathways in the body and to my brain. So when I want to move it, it's a part of me and I can move it. The piece of paper in front of me is not physically connected with neural pathways, but it still is a phenomenon and an appearance within my consciousness, what you might call a back channel. If you think about it, the brain and actually all the cells in our body are phenomenon occurring within this bigger consciousness. The idea is then to try to influence this piece of paper that's totally isolated and get it to rotate. To rotate without any effect from any known physical forces. You explained to me that it's actually quite difficult to do it with a vacuum. Um, so there's... So actually, it's impossible. <laughs> so not just difficult, which is why I've added a, a little twist, which actually allows me to accomplish this in a vacuum. Something very similar to this is inside the, uh, the container. And so what I'm doing is I'm adding random mechanical fluctuations or perturbations to 
the target. By controlling the amplitude of the signal that gets to the speaker, we can control the amplitude and, and how much motion is actually induced in the target, but typically it's probably less than a millimeter. It doesn't cause any large-scale ordered rotation, but rather just this very small oscillation of the target. The standard protocol for doing a proper experimental design is you obtain a baseline period, just establishing that there is no motion, that there is no environmental effect. So what you're saying when we are creating the baseline over several hours, uh, this very small um, linear oscillation is taken into account. Right. And uh, will be visible. And will be visible. So we know that by the time you're influencing the target, we see a big difference and we see the rotation that is coming from the consciousness or the intent as opposed to from the little speaker. I'm going to let you <coughs> try it yourself. I'm gonna leave you some space. Okay. So Mike, how did it go? What happened? If you can see, here's the baseline, and it shows that the target is, is randomly moving back and forth, uh, maybe like a degree or so, peak to peak. And then at this point here, you see a, 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 a larger rotation. It's not something that I am willing with my mind and saying, you know, move or, you know, do this like a command, but rather it's, it's much more of a feeling of connectedness. It is becoming clear that mind and matter are entangled, and the separation between objects and consciousness is nothing but an illusion. If that is the case, then I should be able to influence the same physical object in close proximity, or perhaps a thousand miles away across two states. Well, let's find out. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Hi, nice to see you again. Yeah, you too. Have you been practicing? Yes, I'm looking forward to another session tonight. How long have you been running the device before I came on? So I have about an hour baseline, and then we'll do your session, which is usually, typically, you, you run about an hour or so. And then I continue after you're done uh, running a, a continued uh, baseline afterwards. OK, awesome. I'm ready whenever you are. It was just like turning. That's really something I haven't seen before, having it rotate multiple times in succession like that. Is it possible the people who are watching would say this is a fluke? Could this ever be a fluke since the baseline was established for so long? Typically, um, during the baselines, it's completely motionless and, and still. So I'm confident that the results we're getting are being really provided by your intention and not by any other kinds of environmental factors that could be influencing the target. Every time we continue to get these good results, I become even more confident that this is a true phenomenon and that you really are providing the trigger for these rotations. My theory is when we perform PK or any other mind over matter exercise, our consciousness switches the brain from linear functioning, firing randomly in different areas, to 100% capacity, whereby the brain functions as a whole. 
Anyone can do this. In fact, without knowing the anatomy of the brain, all you have to do is focus your intent on the center of the brain. And that information is then distributed through the corpus callosum to the two hemispheres, which allows you to understand what's going on, and through the endocrine system, which then allows you to feel what is going on. Because the brain is now engaged at its full 100% capacity, you can now perceive and experience things beyond the normal human range, meaning beyond time and space. If this is true, then we should be able to transcend any limitation of our physicality, perhaps even our eyesight. Our first stop is in the UK, where we encounter children who are using blindfolds to access their superhuman abilities. We're gonna play some games. Uh, put your blindfolds on for me, please. Ready? Justin, tell me what's on this card. Teacup. And now, tell me what's on this card. Oh, tiger. Isabella. What is the shape and color of this stone? Kind of like a circle, and I don't, and it's not really, it's kind of like see through. Here's yet another example of how consciousness can interact with the physical world beyond what science claims to be possible. When we work with the blindfold, it's so that we can encourage the children to use the vision that they have with their higher consciousness. Evie, tell me the shape and color of the stone. Um, it's red and kind of a circle. Yes. Evie, tell me what I'm holding in my hand. A wooden spoon. We expand their consciousness beyond that that they believe or understand that they can, take them out into universal energies. OK, now let's go search for that beautiful inner light of yours. I can see it. Fantastic. Bring the light out into the area around you, your light it. field. Good boy. Well I can done. See it. And then they can work with the higher consciousness seeing because they have the potential to see from every cell in their body. Now you're going to read a line each. The other dragons were purple with smooth shiny scales, but Marmaduke was faded orange with sticky out Scales. Excellent, good girl. It's like witnessing a miracle. It's 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 really it's just beautiful to watch. George was enjoying a quiet evening in the heavenly hippo's wildland park. Suddenly, he spotted a group of animals creeping past. The first time I actually saw it for myself, when I come to do my training, the only word I can think of is emotional. It was very emotional. Peter Patter. The rain was trapping and the windows and the wind was banging. When my son um, started to raid and I saw him raiding. Our day out is ruined. They kind of shine. It's just amazing. No mouse would put a paw out in that weather. Needless to say, I wanted to know what it felt like to experience the physical world through these blindfolds. Totally dark. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Witnessing these incredible children up close got us on a journey to discovering others around the world who are applying similar methodologies to achieve mind-blowing results. At MPUSA in Ogden, Utah, a blindfold technique called Vibra Vision helps you sense the vibration of various objects in the physical world. All physical matter in the universe is actually a form of energy that's made up of atoms. And those atoms are cycling or vibrating at a certain frequency. Practicing Vibra Vision gives us the ability to access our sensors and to perceive those vibrations and then convert it into a usable mental image we call Mindsight. Red, red, yellow, blue, yellow, orange, blue, green. Yeah. <laughs>
We can see the unseen to do things that are thought of as impossible. Eight of clubs, ten of diamonds, five of hearts. One, two, three. At MPUSA, folks of all ages demonstrate these incredible skills inside the academy and out in the real world. How about the grilled chicken and sausage gumbo? Gumbo. Nice How much do they cost again? To $29.98. Correct. And Colton, what were you just touching? These are fan boxes. All right. What color is that? That's it. Let's find the Lay's brand. Old Spice Body Wash. Very good. From Utah, we make our way to Stuttgart, Germany. Their children are using a different approach to the methodology and display skills with impeccable accuracy. In the beginning, it felt a bit weird when I was able to see without my eyes, but after a while, you get used to it. I was rather skeptical in the beginning, but once I learned it myself, my reaction was, wow, this really works. I believe much more is possible than we know. Human beings have a lot more skills that they could develop. I also have a granddaughter who learned this skill and bops around with the mask here today. I'm amazed how well it works. Groups around the world are using various techniques to achieve very similar results. I decided to investigate the origin of these methodologies, which led me to InfoVision in Moscow, Russia, and its founder, Mark Komisarov, who discovered blindfold perception 20 years ago. We developed a methodology that first worked with kids. Then I tried it with a blind kid, and it worked too. Then I tried it with adults, and it turns out the methodology also works with adults. And that is what I've been doing for the past 20 years. Mark Komisarov's colleague, Mihaila Istrati, volunteered to offer further assistance on how the InfoVision technique actually works. Once these three are in harmony, consciousness, mind, and brain, then everything works at the speed of which the mind is able to accept this ability. In an attempt to bring scientific validation to their methodology, InfoVision reached out to reputable Italian neurosurgeon, Professor Enrico Pierangeli, and the theoretical physicist, Professor Elio Conti, from the University of Bari in Italy. We prepared some masks. With, uh, we prepared some masks with instrumentation, able to measure the quantity of light inside the mask. Once we were sure the quantity of light inside the mask was zero, the experiment was done. The experiment was done. And the volunteers were And the volunteers were able to read the words on the computer. The computer. 19. 42. Also, when they were asked, also, when they were asked in which color these words were written, they were also able to describe the colors. We just recognized this as a fact. Recognize that this is a fact. Five, nine. Eight, These methodologies can be applied to various eyesight issues, such as Sylvia's advanced farsightedness. Radu's severe astigmatism, which had made it impossible for him to read. Venit, venit, venit 
or even the blind who are now able to perceive their environment with more ease. Now we're talking about something that is not just to help you with your guidance system or sense your environment, but something that is incredibly practical and transformative. When I see the tears of a mother who brought a blind child and the child starts seeing after my seminar, that is what's important. All the senses are coming together, and that gives you the experience of the environment non-locally. So it is not that you are visually seeing what is behind you, you are experiencing what's behind you. Back in the US, I shared my research with my longtime friend Kim, who at the age of 33, discovered she suffered from a rare genetic macular disease. While her condition is medically impossible to cure, Kim was willing to defy the odds and potentially try to regain her perfect eyesight. My eyesight is something that's been not normal for half of my life. So the first half of my life, first 33 years, were perfect vision, perfect. And then at age 33, I, a genetic disease appeared and became uh, worse and worse over a period of two years. And it's a, a rare eye disease and it affects the macula. My biggest problem is I can't read very well and I have a lot of different reading aids. I'm trying to stay like open to anything. So I'm very excited and I'm hoping that I'll have just um, improvement in the sort of clarity of what I can see and be able to read a little easier, to be able to see somebody's face a little clearer, read a sign, it's just, so frustrating. One of the things we did that was really mind-blowing was to wear a mask uh, that completely blacked out all light. There we go. I'd like you to look around the mask in the darkness for the beginning. And sooner or later, you will start to see some little lights here and there. You sit there for a while, and then all of a sudden you start seeing things. All right, now I have a white dot. I started to see the whole, it was as if I was seeing the whole universe, all of the stars, all of the constellations. You could actually see the stars blinking, you could see meteors because I can still see the stars, the stars are jumping. It was very cool. It's like you were, and so you could just sit there for a while and just enjoy the, the show. And then we started to use colored pieces of paper to determine if I could see colors. Yeah, so let's do like this. This is um, green. See if there's any difference in the colors. Here says purple, the opposite color. Mm -hmm. Here, oh, here is red. Well, I couldn't see 100% of the colors. Some of the darker colors were harder to see. I could see colors. I just have Good. to wait and then it shows yes. up. Which is kind of the point of the whole thing. You don't need your eyes, it's your awareness or your consciousness that actually is doing the perception. And it actually feeds to your visual system so you can then see it. So your consciousness sees it before your eyes see it, not the other way around. Everything's your attitude, which is your perspective, the way you go into things. It's just keep that attitude. I can do, I can do this, anybody can do this. That seems like it's blue. It is blue. Let's start with the mask. And I'd like you to set your focus as a periscope on the papers that I want you to see. Green. 
Excellent. Excellent. Looks like a pinky red, magenta, whatever. Pinky, pinky yeah, red. 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 Excellent. Excellent. I got yellow. Yellow it is. Oh. <laughs> well done. Pink. Marvelous. It is pink. Oh, wow. My instructor would show me letters. Uh, she'd hold up little kids' letters, and they'd be in, in a color, and they're all capital letters. And I could actually see those. So, and that wasn't right here in front of me. It was, she's in Romania, so it's many, many miles away. I have a T. Amazing, Kim. That's what it is. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Normally, if I pick up something to read, I get my magnifying glass and I assume this position. And this is really hard on my neck. It hurts. And I've had some neck problems from constantly doing the same pattern. But now I'll, I just pick it up, I look at it, and I just wait. And then I start reading. OK, so now it's getting really easy. I used to take notes and just write as if I, like I used to write, and thinking I, I was writing well, but I wasn't. And so now what I'm doing is taking my time and seeing what I'm writing and making sure that each letter has a space around it and so that I can now go back and read it, whereas before I couldn't see anything because the letters were on top of each other. Okay, this says, let's try this now. I am going to write in different sizes. So now I'm just deciding to pay attention, take my time, and now I can read what I write. Huge. The idea that seeing is not believing, that seeing doesn't have anything to do with it. It's more like you can perceive everything, the visible, the invisible, whatever. You, you perceive it with your consciousness and your awareness. It's not seeing is believing. In fact, it's probably the opposite because your brain plays tricks on you through your vision and other things. So I, I think this is a, a huge concept that's applicable to everything. The blindfolds are an incredible tool that remind us that we don't actually see with our eyes, we see with our brain. But it is your consciousness that is reprogramming and directing your brain to perceive what you want to perceive and experience what you want to experience. This is what this is about, mind over matter. If the current scientific laws of physical reality were accurate and complete, then they shouldn't be broken, ever. And yet these laws are being broken every day repeatedly by hundreds of people around the world. The bottom line is this, no matter what you believe in, if you believe we live in a matrix in someone else's simulation, or if you believe in God or Buddha, or if you're an atheist and there's nothing beyond this physical world, the most powerful technology in the universe is consciousness. If your consciousness can change the chemistry of your body, if your consciousness can allow you to see perfectly without the use of your eyes, if your consciousness can allow you to move a physical object without physical contact, if you can influence an electrical device, an electronic device or a computer nearby or at a distance, well then who's more powerful, you or the physical world? Consciousness evolves by lowering its entropy. It does that by making choices. And by those choices, the individuated units of consciousness can evolve if they make good choices toward caring, toward love, toward consideration, or they can make poor choices and de-evolve toward fear, self-centeredness. It's all about me. We live in a world where freedom and free will are part of the design. And within that, there's choices that can be made, and those choices have impact throughout the entire quantum field, all great distances from our thoughts and how that bounces off and echoes out of the matrix and how that bounces back and influences us. So there's a dialogue going on with that. 
So we sort of come to this world, and I guess in our materialistic sense, we want to forget about vibrations and things like that. We just want to think of matter and stuff. What part of your life has been the most significant? And I'll bet it's not the stuff. It's not the car, it's not the house you live in. It's there and it's important. Yeah, you, know, you need your car to get around and so on. But what's really important in your life are your relationships, the caring, the love, the significance of connecting with other people. What am I doing here? I know I have to pass on my this and I have to give my kids this and I have to, you know, it's all of this stuff. Love, I think, is the main reason we're here. For me, knowing that that's it um, allows me to, to look at every day and just, I'm in love with life. The purpose of the universe is for life to emerge and thrive. We believe that these principles are universe-wide. The purpose in so many ways of existence is to know thyself. The self-awareness of the universe, this profound quality of awareness, of conscious awareness of existence, is inherent in the universe itself. Exploring your superhuman abilities allows you to discover your own potential, the mechanics of your consciousness, in other words, understand who you really are. As you think, as you feel, as you make choices, you contribute to the expansion of humanity as a whole. From a limited state of being to an elevated superhuman species that fits within the grand design of an intelligent universe. So now ask yourself, are you a superhuman?